Um, this is the latest in its ongoing series of author panels. It's brought to you by Promoting Yorkshire Authors, um, whose badges we're all wearing, and also with the help of our friends here from Harriet Library. Um, my name is John Jackson, I'm an author, and I write historical fiction with a strong romantic thread. So back to today's discussion, it's entitled The 20th Century, The World at War. And today we were joined by three Yorkshire-based authors, Sylvia Brody, who's an old friend of mine, uh, Maggie Cobbett, and Paul Smith. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves properly. Uh, last weekend, we remembered the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day, and it was an extremely emotional weekend, particularly those of us who were sort of following it on television. Uh, I think many of us, I'm sure, who watched Peter Jackson's incredible film, They Shall Not Grow Old, on the Sunday evening. Well, happily for me, I'm young enough I managed to avoid both the world wars, but my family did not, like most families in the UK. In fact, my grandfather, he died in 1915 in Mesopotamia, which is one of the great forgotten campaigns of World War I. He was killed by Turkish machine gunners at, uh, at Ktesiphon, just outside Baghdad, and he's buried in a communal grave, like many other soldiers all over both eastern and western fronts, and his name is on the war memorial in Basra. My other connection with the war is perhaps slightly happier. We all know the poem for the fallen, the one that starts, They Shall Not Go Hold. It was actually written by Lawrence Binion. Lawrence Binion was a cousin of mine, uh, but that's certainly enough about it. I was born in 1937, so I can remember the war, part, partly. My earliest recollection is my, when my dad was getting on the train, my mum was holding my baby brother and I was clinging to him. That's all I can remember, was mm. the face, the sad faces. So I would have been about two then, mm. yeah. Then later, later on, I was evacuated for one year, but after that, um, my dad came to see me, he was home on leave. He was in the Royal Scotch Fusiliers with my dad. And um, he came to see me and I cried that much that he brought me home. But where we lived in Hull, we was quite near to the docks, the railways, the shipbuilding. We was actually in the middle of everything. And I can only re vaguely remember some things, but the one that's the event that sticks out in my mind is one night there was, there was a really big bombing raid and my mum said to me, she had me, my brother who was two, and a baby. So she said to me, get Brian dressed, the two year old. So I got him dressed. And when we looked again, he was undressed and back in bed. So I had to get him out again and do it. Mm -hmm. And we were running through the street. Where our shelters were, there, there was in the field right at the bottom of the street where we lived. So we had to run down the street. And everywhere around us is on fire. And you, you can hear people squealing because there was a, um, a small building nearby. So we're running through the street. I can remember the baby's dummy dropped and we had to stop and pick it up. But I can't remember anything else, what happened. Not until the morning. Now, in the morning, we all stood down our street in a long line. And every, on one side of the street, it has gone completely. And across that side was a railway line where the bombers was really aiming for, but they hit the street instead. And everywhere was steaming with smoke no, and stuff. No, so that's really all my recollections about the war. But, my dad, in the Royal Scotch Fusiliers, he was finished as an acting sergeant major. He was injured, and I don't know which battlefield, I haven't been able to find out. March 1945, in Georgia. He was shot in the neck, so he was paralysed down his right side. He said he was lucky, he fell in a hole on the battlefield. The German tanks came along crushed everybody. I feel so upset. Sorry. So he laid on his back for 18 months. But he survived. He survived. So <coughs> what I write about sometimes comes from what I can remember in my childhood. One of the things with Hull was because it is an, uh, 
North East Coast town. It suffered tremendous damage from the bombs, from the bombers, because they would dump their bomb bombs there if they hadn't been able to find their target. But I'm, I, now I live near to Beverly, and there's Beverly Minster there, and that was never bombed during the war because they used the Minster as a, a market. Mm. Just when they got there, because there was all the airfields that the, you know, where the mm. bombers were and everything, all around. So that was a market. Yeah. Well, like John, I missed the war, but um, my family, both sides, were quite heavily involved, so I grew up with a lot of wartime stories, some along similar lines to the, the ones that Sylvia's told. My own interest in the wars, though, has always been more about the effect on the people left at home rather than what was going on on the battlefield, and so I've written quite a lot of short stories on the subject. Because I used to teach modern languages, quite a few of them are set on the continent. For example, I've got a lot of friends in the Netherlands, and I've written about the effects of the, the German occupation in the Netherlands and so on, and particularly in France. So the, the novel, which I, I imagine that I'll be talking about at some point, Shadows of the Past, is set over three time periods in a fictional French village. And the reason I wrote it is because I was in the actual village when I was 17, the first time I'd ever been to France, and was struck even then, a good 20 odd years after the war, by the way that people were still talking about it, and the way that older people in the village still had their little groups why they would be pointing the finger at other people saying, oh, so-and-so was a collaborator and so-and-so did this and don't talk to that woman over there because when the Germans were here and all this kind of thing. So although I was only 17, I was absorbing all this. And when I got the idea for the novel, I used that as a basis and went back to the events of the war about which I'd been told quite a lot particularly with regard to the occupation. If you happen to study a copy of this, there are a few at the back, you see there's a framed photograph on the front of a young couple. And in fact, the girl is myself, age 17. So the central part of the book is very largely autobiographical. So that although the framework of the war is there, there's reference to all sorts of campaigns and that kind of thing. There aren't actually any battle scenes. It's not the kind of thing I write. The war is just very much a background, a framework against which the lives of ordinary people are carrying on. And the French have, have an expression, débrouillard, which means essentially coping. Mm. During the war, you did what you had to cope. When I, was a, when I was a kid, I was born in 1950, so I missed the war too. But I was surrounded by people who hadn't. There was a lot of the war around me, and of course, as a child, because it was, the history was so close, I wasn't really interested in it. It's only as I've grown older that I actually, um, I believe that there are lessons that we can learn from all of the wars, but the Second World War in particular. I, I went to the, the Ripon commemoration of the 100 years, um, and actually um, it was very touching. It was very touching in many ways because there were quite a few young people there, because it's the young people who need to learn the lessons from the, the war. And that's why I wrote this book, actually. I wrote, it's called Question the Resistance. It's set in uh, wartime France. And I recognize some of the, the attitudes that you're talking about there. Certainly the coping, you know, the, 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 the thing throughout this book is really about, there are many ways of resisting. And uh, some of it means collaborating, but not in the way that you might think. Not that horrible word, collaborating, but actually doing what you need to in order to get by, to survive. And I think any of us who, who have never you know, been in a situation where we have to survive in those conditions, I don't think I'm in a position to judge uh, those who, who did. It has an unusual start, uh, start to the book in that there are two young people who find themselves in occupied France, northern France, and in unusual circumstances. And it's about their story, really. It's about what happened to them. They had to suddenly come to terms with the fact that they were in occupied France, sorry, with the German occupation. I, it's, it's geared towards uh, adults of all ages, really, but also geared towards a young adult. I'm hoping that people of a younger age might read it because it's got some aspects of, of modern life in it as well that might make them interested in some of the history without ramming it down their throats. Sylvie's most recent book, The Lost Daughter, is just come to publication. It's actually out in a week or so. How come to write this book? I met a lady 
many years ago, and she was a nurse during the Second World War. But she was a nurse with the air ambulance who flew out to the front. And then I'm all, I've been a fan of long lost families. So this really, it, it starts before the Second World War. So you've got all your family and the setting and everything. It's in Hull. And it's a story how people become separated and divided before the war and even so more during the war. Originally she, she wasn't she started off as a nurse and she nursed the sick. And then one day she was asked if she would go, you want to what you volunteered for this, for the air. So she passed the test and everything. And then but what I didn't realise till I was researching that when they went out to the front in the plains of Dakota, there was no Red Cross on because they took live ammunition, bombs, whatever they needed at the front, they took. <coughs> and so it had to be unloaded before they could get the, the injured on. So that it, it was perhaps a matter of minutes before that they would come. Now, I'll just read you a little scene about what happened. About two weeks later, Tally flew out on a mission ahead of Alice. Alice is the main character who had to wait for more uploading on the plane. So she was a good 30 minutes behind. Their destination was the Netherlands, somewhere near to the German border. When the decoder that Alice was in touched down on the narrow airstrip, they was aware of total confusion. Alice scrambled from the plane and dropped down as a sniper's bullet whizzed by her head. She laid flat in the chair of muddy soil. The smell of a musty, coarse dampness, stench of air filled her nostrils and she clamped her mouth shut and waited. There was an exchange of fire from the British troops and soon the Germans retreated. Alice cautiously got to her feet and looked around. Reinforcement arrived and then the wounded, hidden in a dugout, were now being brought out to safety. It was then that she saw her. Tally, she cried, but Tally didn't move or respond. Alice ran to where her friend lay crumbled on the ground. She fell to her knees and felt Tally's pulse. It was weak and there was blood coming from her shoulder. Quickly from her back, Alice produced a dressing to stem the flow of blood. She needed to get her on board immediately. She looked round, surveying the scene. The crew were busy unloading, and the crew of the other decoders were doing the same. Now the shooting was over. She was on her feet, shouting to a man who'd only had a superficial wound in, to his face. I need your help. Between them, they lifted Tally onto Alice's decoder and rested her on one of the low bunks. Thanks, can you make sure that those able to get aboard the first decoder? Sure, he replied. Tally was coming round, moaning in pain. You're safe. I soothed as she lifted her head to administer morphine for the pain. I'm going to leave you while I get the others aboard. So the, face, the nurses faced a lot of danger with that. He, he lost his leg. So, it's afterwards, you know, where, when when the war is over, you know, how thing, how do they cope? It's the thing, just because just because you have a ceasefire, the, the effects don't stop then. No, and the, no. the effects will last for generations yeah. to the time. That women had been doing jobs that men usually did, yes. and so when they came home, the men wanted the jobs. Yeah, back, of course, didn't they? But them who had been badly wounded, like my dad, he. He was a qualified flower miller, but he had to take a menial job because he couldn't do the work. Yeah. There was no social security or anything like that. Yeah. The, there was also, I think, back in those days, a greater sense of community feeling. Oh, Some and I were talking in the yeah. car on the way on, on the way over, where, well, a lot of people sort of who expect the government to have a safety net or provide a safety net today. They didn't back then, the community did. I'd like to read a couple of extracts, if Please. I may. Um, the, the 1960s section of the book is set in what is supposed to be an international youth work camp. I mean, it's a very complicated story. It turns out to be not at all what it was set up for. But 
Even when I was there in the 1960s in the actual place, all the talk was of how wonderful it was to get young people together, whether they were French or Dutch or German or whatever they might be. And on the surface, things were fine. And we all used to go down into the village in the evenings, to the village cafe. And the landlady down there was a very peculiar character. It always used to intrigue us that she had black hair, very black eyebrows, obviously done with an eyebrow pencil, and yet blonde roots. Mm -hmm. Now, lots and lots of dark-haired ladies dye their hair blonde, but how many natural blondes dye their hair black? Mm -hmm. And we all used to wonder why, and later on I did find out why. I witnessed a scene outside the cafe one evening, not long after I'd, I'd arrived, which has actually been reproduced more or less word for word in the book. When a group of us went down there for a drink, the, uh, the German boys gets into a fight with one of the French boys, not over politics or anything like that, but over a girl, actually. Um, his sister, one of the French boys, is trying to chat up his sister and the German boy takes accept exception to it. Two of the leather-jacketed boys that come across to chat up the German twins, and one of them was lying flat on his back. Fight! 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 Both establishments emptied rapidly as their young customers squared up to each other. But it was Thérèse Gaudet's intervention that startled everyone. Bursting out of the café, elbowing the crowd out of her way, she flew at Hans Peter, shook her fist in his face and started to screech at him. Daisy couldn't understand most of it and had to have it explained to her later that Bosch was a rude word to call a German. It seemed that they still weren't welcome in the village as far as the café owner was concerned. The strange woman ranted at the startled boy until her fury was spent and then rushed back inside, hiding her face in her apron. The door slammed and the blind came down. Everyone was embarrassed by the outburst. Even the French boy Hans Peter had punched. He muttered an apology to the young German who handed him a couple of paper serviettes to mop up the blood from his cut, cut lip. Daisy, who was walking with the same group, wanted to know if he was all right. A bit shaken, he confessed. I wasn't expecting anything like that to happen to me in France so long after the war. Uh, this is 20 years after the war, where memories amongst the older people in the village were still very fresh. And in fact, the lady who flew at him had very good reason to hate the Germans, but that comes out later in the book. But the other extract I'd like to read, if I may, is um, when the Germans actually arrive in the town. I was quite startled, long after I'd finished the book and it had come out, to come across a French TV series called Un Village Francais. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it traces the life, again, of a fictional French village from about 1930, early 1939, right up until after the liberation. Watching the scenes, this particular one, I could actually see my own story. <laughs> it wasn't long before the Germans were goose-stepping down the Champs-Élysées and putting big signs in Gothic script over the buildings that they commandeered. But taking over the capital seemed to keep them happy for a while. Maybe they wouldn't bother with a little backwater like ours. Valentin was washing the cafe windows the morning they arrived. A couple of motorcycles with sidecars swept past, followed by armoured vehicles full of soldiers in greenish-grey uniforms. Their highly polished steel helmets were dazzling in the sunlight, and every man was heavily armed. The convoy went straight through the Place de Verdun and up to their chosen commandateur. Baltzinger reported later that he stood with the rest of the staff as the Countess elegant as always with her silver chignon and fine pearls, handed over the keys to the chateau without a word. The French flag over the town hall had been taken down and replaced by a black swastika swimming in a blood-red black background. To add to the state of shock in the village, notices started to go up all over the place, threatening the death penalty for acts of sabotage or attacks on the German troops. They were certainly taking no chances. The tall sergeant in charge of the operation had a submachine gun, and some of his men had sacks of grenades slung casually over their shoulders, in addition to their rifles. Even so, when they realised that only women and children were in the little crowd watching them, the soldiers started to relax. One or two of them, clean-shaven and confident, even winked and offered sweets. 
Stony-faced and conscious of the scrutiny of their neighbours, the mothers held their children back, but the Germans knew that time was on their side. They didn't even look offended when one woman, who had been brought up near the Belgian border and lived under German occupation before, pointedly turned her back on them. And then as the weeks go on, the locals relax, the Germans are absorbed into the community. Some people are always actively hostile, some people look friendly on the surface, surface but are secretly hostile. And relationships do build up between the occupying troops and the villagers. Um, if you sort of fall for or find yourself falling in love with somebody who is your, essentially your captor, it's known as Stockhausen Syndrome. It's, very, it's, it's a very well-known thing. I think there was also the point that in my fictional village, as in the real village on which it's based, a lot of the German soldiers were billeted with French families. Mm. And although they kept up the pretense of hostility outside, behind closed doors, a lot of the mothers realised that these were basically just frightened teenagers. Yeah. They'd been brought up on the notion of brutal Germans, but they were young lads on yes. their own. It's about two people, uh, Jacques and Georges, uh, both living in England, but actually are French. But they, they actually appear in occupied France and then get caught up in the Maquis, in the resistance, and end up in a, in a Maquis. They sort of arrive at the Maquis and, the, and then they have to be assimilated into them. There's a lot of distrust of them, when mm. particularly as they're, they're outsiders. We still had our emergency grenades, knife and garrote. I didn't see how that would help me if the German guards opened fire. I did not see any German guards, but that did not mean that there were none around. George left the edge of the wood first and made it quickly to his position. I saw his sign that he was in place and Luke hissed for me to go to him. I remembered the plan now and started to put it into action, shedding the what-ifs, which were merely clutter. We crept slowly over to the first locomotive. I felt vulnerable when crossing the line. At the side of the huge engine, I felt secure. The beast hissed, almost alive, and its metal was warm and inviting. <clears throat> Our contact was there, and he showed me the controls. It was not dissimilar to what Luke had drawn. He pointed at the pressure gauge. It had a good head of steam and was ready to roll. The safety valve hissed regularly, releasing the pent-up energy of this dragon. I now had the unpleasant task to perform. Our contact told me to hit him and make it believable. I surprised myself and hit him hard. I learnt later that I'd fractured his jaw and he was in pain for weak. The blow was hard enough that the Germans never suspected him of being involved in the sabotage. I led him to the engine shed, out of the cold, and tied him firmly. I could see that his face was swelling, and he would have bruising the next day. I felt remorse for what I'd done, but it didn't last long. I returned to the locomotive and looked at my watch. Three more minutes to go. I looked at the coal train, and I could see Luke in the engine cab. Two minutes. I looked around from my vantage point in the cab and saw a German guard crossing the line heading towards the station. He did not look my way. I looked back to see where Georges was hiding and saw him raise the gun in readiness. I prayed that he would not preempt and fire too early. The guard carried on to the station building and I saw him go inside one minute to go. A light in the station building came on and I saw the silhouette of a German guard having a leak. Thank God, I thought. It was time. I pushed forward the valve and heard the creak as the brute came alive. Tiff, take off the brake. Do not forget it. I released it and the creature lurched forward. A few miles an hour at first and then it started to accelerate. Time to go, I thought, and I leapt across the cab and was out of the other side. I was disorientated for a few seconds and lined myself up with the building. I could see the clearing. The locomotive was accelerating now and I could hear its sound becoming fainter as it headed down the valley. And my, I made my way gently and slowly towards the clearing. I could see Georges at this post and I recovered my Bren gun. Luke was to return and Georges was to be last to leave. That was how it has to be. It was only a minute before Luke started the coal train. It seemed like an eternity. Adrenaline was surging through my veins and my senses were keen. I wondered how Georges was feeling. I had no way of knowing as I lay on my stomach, clutching my Bren gun and waiting for Luke to return. I heard the coal train start, slowly at first and then accelerating. I hoped that Luke had jumped clear. It was soon in the distance, but there was no sign of Luke. It was a full five minutes until Luke arrived, and he gave the agreed call as he approached. Is it done? George whispered. Luke said, it's done. Read it. I don't know if anybody really knows about the air ambulance nest. 
they was called the Flying Nightingales, and they became well known in established parts of the crew who filled the missions. The men, and sometimes women, who were casualties at the front, and Trumasot knew that. They saw the plane took them, they would be safe, and soon on their way home. Paris had been liberated, and now the war in Europe was over, but the Japanese had not yet surrendered. Alice and the crew of the Dakota touched down in Paris, and they caught a glimpse of General de Gaulle's tall figure. In the distance, amid the crowd of people who were celebrating, they had no time to join in the merrymaking, for once the supplies were offloaded, they were on their way. On one trip to France, Alice was approached by a soldier. Could you do me a favour, he asked. Alice looked at the airless face and wondered what it meant. I will if I can, she replied. He drew a letter from the breast pocket and whispered, Will you post this to my girl back home? Alice took the letter from his outstretched hand. Of course I will, she said, putting it in the side of her bag. And it became a regular occurrence to post letters from servicemen to their loved ones back home. Once a French woman caught hold of Alice's hand and thrust a letter into her hand. Alice didn't understand the French language except for a few words, and the woman spoke in a garbled tongue. But Alice picked up the drift of it. For your daughter, she said. Tears flooded the woman's dark eyes, and she showed Alice a tiny photograph of a young girl, about the age of four or five. Alice said, felt tears prick her own eyes, for she thought of her own daughter, if only she could post a letter to her. Time to go, one of the crew shouted to her. I will post it, madam, she assured the woman, who thanked her profusely. There was many flying missions bringing wounded troops home, and there was terrible tales of civilian atrocities they had, they had seen and witnessed. Hearing this, Alice felt that those who had suffered so much under the regime of Hitler. To think that humans could afflict such barbarism on mankind is humane. Alice said to Tally as I climbed into their bunks that night. I'm glad I'm a nurse taking care of the wounded and helping to save life. This was in tune with their beliefs and thinking. What do you think was the reply from Alice? Just gentle sound of snow. They flew a lot more missions and to liberating the camps. But um, Alice had a husband who she'd run away from because he was cruel to her. And she really wanted, she'd met someone else, so she wanted to get married. But in those days, it wasn't possible for the divorce and that. And she, she came to one camp for the prisoners of war in, and she found two men in this hut, both very thin, nothing to eat or drink or anything. And one of them was, dying and the man the, the other one said i can't leave him he said because i'm the only one he's got and when she goes to the man she realizes it's her husband so she looks after him he was cruel to her very but in his last hours minutes she was there for him so, so she had to put aside her own feelings because she was a nurse and in another incident when she was put in prison, uh, injured on board the Dakota, one of them was a German, a young German lad, and he was frightened. He was only young, perhaps 18 or 19. But on board was a man, a soldier, quite a high up one, injured. And he really, really kicked up a stink about this German lad being on. So it was quite difficult for them. Mm. They, they had to be sort of arbitrators as well. I remember after the war, doing my family tree, I found that on my dad's mother's side, the Germans. Mm. <laughs> There's a village just outside the Moche in France called Oradosa Glan. Mm. And it is the most sobering thing I think I've ever seen in my life, going to Oradosa Glan. It's famous as being a village that was after an act of resistance, it was visited by the SAS, who machine gunned all the males, put all the women and children in the church and burnt it. 
and the total death, death toll was, I think, just under a thousand altogether. And since the war, it has not been touched. You didn't mean man. the SAS, did you? You meant the, the SS. SS. SS, yes, <laughs> thank God, yeah, sorry about that. The Freudian slip, if ever there was one. I've been at pains in yeah. my story to draw a distinction between the SS and the ordinary German yes, soldiers. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There was a huge difference. Mm. The ordinary German soldiers, in many cases, were both frightened of the SS God, yeah. and mm. appalled by what they did, mm. yes. and the Gestapo, yeah. yes. same sort of thing. It does. We're looking at the aftermath of war and all the rest of it as yeah. part of this session. Do you think that's going to influence your writing in what you're taking up now, and writing, or expect to write in the immediate future? Maggie, something oh, I like think that. it always will. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a theme I return to quite frequently. Mm. Now, I was going to say that some of the things that happened in France after the liberation in some ways were even worse than what had happened during the occupation. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I met people in the village, for example, who had been penalised for things that really weren't their fault. Mm. When it came to collaboration, as an example, sleeping with German soldiers, which they called collaboration horizontale, mm. quite often women who had been raped were punished afterwards mm. for that, whereas women who had done it for money, mm. it was just regarded as, oh, well, you know, it was a matter of business, and yes. they got away with it. And when it came to all the head shaving, quite a few innocent women had their heads mm. shaved. And I even met one old lady, she'd been in a concentration camp, she showed me the number on her arm, and she said that when she came back, because she'd had her head shaven in the camp mm. and had to wear a head scarf, People were spitting at her in the street because they thought she was one of these women whose head had been shaved mm. because of sleeping with the Germans. Yeah. And this went on for quite some time. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. hideous. What happened during the war? Uh, I mean, the interesting thing is, when I was a kid, you know, there, there were lots of people who'd been damaged by the war, mm. I think, around me. But they didn't really talk about it. No. You know, it was only in later years, actually, that, that I learned anything about what had happened in the war. You know. Almost too late. Mm. Almost too late. I wish I'd known a bit about it earlier. But you know, there are lots of lessons from the wars around mm. for, for now. You know, the easy answers, the, yeah. the scapegoat for somebody to hear. I mean, look in America now. Mm. Look at what's happened with Brexit at the moment. Oh. And it, it's it's too easy, and you know, it's too easy to, to create these simple answers. And, and if I look at my the books I write in terms of uh, fantasy, they're actually about good and evil. Yes. And a lot of the politics that goes on inside of that mm. is very similar to the politics mm. that caused us it that you know got us into the war in the first mm. place. That actually is heading for us heading in exactly the same direction at the moment. So mm. so yes, it's influenced. I think the the flying nightingales you know, who treated uh, a thousand ten no hundred thousand troops about planes during the war. There was never recognised mm. at all for what they did, and it wasn't well later on. I think it was Camilla Charles' wife who sort of gave, you know, presented them with a medal or, or an honour. And by this time, there was only a handful of them left. Mm. Most of them had died. And during yeah. the war, the Merchant Navy had the largest percentage of losses of any oh, yeah. service. Yeah. 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 Mm. But was it recognised? Not really. No, 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 no not, certainly yeah. not in the same way. Possibly because the Merchant Navy, you're employed essentially commercially rather than working for the Army or the Navy or the Air Force.